While the battle in federal court heated up, the atmosphere in Dover had gone from divisive to dangerous. Tammy Kitzmiller, the lead plaintiff in the case who had a daughter in ninth grade biology class at Dover High School, had been receiving hate mail since the start of the trial. One letter was pretty disturbing. I think this was the one with the passage that um, the last sentence, especially Madeline Murray was found murdered for taking prayer and Bible reading out of the schools, so watch out for a bullet. Um, this was a letter that I made sure I, my lawyers got a copy of and it was forwarded to the FBI. Anywhere you turned, we were getting attacked. I mean, the pe people in the community were attacking us in the newspapers, people in our own profession were attacking us, saying, you know, what are you guys doing in Dover? Why are you letting this happen? People in the community were calling us atheists, which was a bit offensive to two of us in the department because two of us happened to be sons and daughters of ministers. I fail to understand how teachers can call themselves Christians, go to church, talk about God, talk about Christ, and then go to ch school five days a week and talk about Darwin and teach it as if it's fact. Not a theory, but that's how it happened. I, I don't understand that. To me, that's talking out of both sides of your mouth. Having ignited much of the controversy that resulted in the lawsuit, Bill Buckingham had made a surprise announcement. Citing poor health and struggles with OxyContin as a result of surgery, he resigned from the school board and moved out of state. A school board election was only months away, and now eight of the nine seats would be up for grabs, putting intelligent design on trial in the voting booth as well as the courtroom. Dover science teacher Brian Ream, who had already moved on to another school system, had thrown his hat in the ring. I couldn't work for a board that was going to mandate we teach religious ideas in the science classroom. I've got kids in the district, and that's not the kind of district I want my kids going to school in. So the choice was either move the whole family or try and fix the district that we live in. We chose to fix it. But when he hit the campaign trail, Brian found himself again in the line of fire in the war on evolution. The problems that I ran into in the campaign being out door to door were people just wouldn't listen to you and just automatically judged you in advance that you're this kind of person and we're good Christians, we'd never vote for you. And they slam the door in your face, forgetting their windows are open and call you and or <laughs> tell you you're just a damn atheist. Every step I take, I'm taking you. You walk my way. For the Reams, this was particularly hurtful. Both are active in their church and run a summer Bible school program. We have a neighbor, actually, who was appointed to the school board and was in support of intelligent design, and he was out campaigning and saying very negative things about our family, how we're atheists, and if you vote for those atheists, well, then God's not going to be happy with you. We are members of the same body, serving the whole To make the case for intelligent design, the defense had lined up eight expert witnesses, including several members of the Discovery Institute, the Seattle organization that promotes intelligent design. But of those eight witnesses, five never testified. Witnesses um, started dropping like flies. We still haven't heard a complete explanation of uh, why this happened, but there was some dispute going on between the Discovery Institute and the Thomas More Law Center over how the case would be run. Nova made repeated requests to interview members of the Discovery Institute to talk about this and other issues. But the Institute set conditions that were inconsistent with normal journalistic practice. For the defense to win, however, did not require a large number of witnesses. Our aim was not really to disprove Darwin's theory of evolution. Our aim was to merely show that there are credible scientists who believe that the empirical data was supportive of intelligent design. That's all we had to show. It was our thinking, if they could prove that there was a scientific basis for intelligent design, that it would be possible that the court could conclude that there was a valid secular purpose for teaching intelligent design. I think everybody was waiting to see whether or not the intelligent design folks had a case. But by the time we finished presenting our case, um, 
I think the, the, it was pretty clear that everything rested on Michael Behe's testimony. A scientist and senior fellow at the Discovery Institute, Michael Behe is the author of the popular intelligent design book, Darwin's Black Box, and dozens of papers unrelated to intelligent design published in peer-reviewed science journals. Behe refused multiple invitations from NOVA to be interviewed for this program, though he went on record in the trial. Dr. Behe, what is your profession? I am a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And you're a biochemist? And that's correct, yes. How long have you taught at the college level? Uh, for 23 years. Sir, what is intelligent design? Intelligent design is a scientific theory that proposes that some aspects of life are best explained as the result of design and that the strong appearance of design in life is real and not just apparent. Is intelligent design based on any religious beliefs or convictions? No, it isn't. What is it based on? It is based entirely on observable, empirical, physical evidence from nature, plus logical inferences. Now, when you use the term design, what do you mean? Well, I discuss this in my book, Darwin's Black Box, and a short description of design is shown in this quotation from chapter 9. Quote, what is design? Design is simply the purposeful arrangement of parts. When we perceive that parts have been arranged to fulfill a purpose, that's when we infer design. End quote. Part of the defense strategy would be to show the judge examples of biological systems they claimed were too complex to have evolved by natural selection, and therefore must have been yes. the product of a designer. Can you give us a biochemical example of design, Dr. Behe? Yes, uh, that's on the next slide. I think the best, well, the most visually striking example of design is something called the bacterial flagellum. Now, th this is a figure of a bacterial flagellum taken from a textbook, which is widely used in colleges and universities around the country. The bacterial flagellum is quite literally an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. And in order to accomplish that function, it has a number of parts which are ordered to that effect. Now, this part here, which is labeled the filament, is actually the propeller of the bacterial flagellum. The motor is actually a rotary motor. And most people who see this and have the function explained to them quickly realize that these parts are ordered for a purpose and therefore bespeak design. Under the microscope, bacteria powered by flagella seem almost acrobatic. They tumble, corkscrew, and pirouette, thanks to that whip-like filament. Driving this propeller is a tiny motor, part of a complex structure made of about 40 different kinds of proteins. The bacterial flagellum looks like a sort of Jules Verne notion of what the future looks like. It has a strange sort of mechanical quality to it, these sort of cogs and waving tails and stuff. And according to Behe, if any one of these parts is missing from the system, the motor can't function. Behe calls systems like this irreducibly complex, a term he coined. And he argues such systems could not have evolved naturally. The idea is that there are certain aspects of life, uh, perhaps uh, organisms or organs or even cells, that in a sense um, could only have uh, come about as a whole. In other words, it was very unlikely they could have come about through just a kind of uh, contingent combination of parts over even millions or billions of years but rather in a sense had to be created whole cloth all together at once because everything fits together so well that to remove one part the thing wouldn't function have other scientists acknowledge these design features of the flagellum yes they have uh, if you could advance the next slide in 1998, a man named David DeRosier wrote an article in the journal Cell, which is a very prestigious scientific journal, uh, entitled The Turn of the Screw, the Bacterial Flagellar Motor. Uh, now, David DeRosier is a professor of biology at Brandeis University in Massachusetts and has worked on the bacterial flagellar motor for most of his career. Now, in that article, he makes a statement, quote, more so than other motors, the flagellum resembles a machine designed by a human, close quote. 
So David de Rosier also recognizes that the structure of the flagellum appears designed. What I wrote was, this is a machine that looks like it was designed by a human, but that doesn't mean it was designed, that is, the product of intelligent design. Indeed, um, this more has all the earmarks of something that arose by evolution. Using an electron microscope, de Rosier produces ghostly pictures like this one, revealing the inner workings of what's been called the world's most efficient motor. This is the drive shaft. This transmits this torque generated by the motor. That would then turn the propeller, which would push the bacterial cell through the fluid. Michael Behe has argued that the flagellum could not have evolved since its parts have no function for natural selection to act on until they are fully assembled. But evidence that refutes Behe's claim of irreducible complexity comes from a tiny syringe that injects poison, found in some of the nastiest of all bacteria. This is a structure found, for example, in Yersinia pestis, the bacterium that causes the bubonic plague. And look at the similarities. Now, this structure doesn't rotate, but it still has to extend this structure, which is equivalent to the rod, the drive shaft here. It has to extend that because it needs this little channel. It's like sort of like a syringe. So the, the virulence factors that are made inside the cell, which is down here, can be exported, pushed up into this hole, and exported out through this long kind of needle, perhaps into a, a cell in your body or mine, and thereby create misery. And it turns out the two structures look similar for a reason. The syringe on the right is made of a subset of the very same protein types found in the base of the flagellum on the left. Though the syringe is missing proteins found in the motor and therefore cannot produce rotary motion, it functions perfectly as an apparatus for transmitting disease. So if we think about uh, what it means to be irreducibly complex, the argument is that if you take away even one of these proteins that the structure uh, cannot function. And yet here is a structure that functions that is missing several of the proteins, and yet here it is, a working viable organelle of the bacterium. So indeed, this structure is not, in that sense, irreducibly complex. To emphasize de Rosier's point, Miller arrived at court making an unusual fashion statement. As an example of what irreducible complexity means, advocates of intelligent design like to point to a very common machine, the mousetrap. And the mousetrap is composed of five parts. It has a base plate, the catch, a spring, a little hammer that actually does the dirty work, and a bait holder. The mousetrap will not work if any one of these five parts are taken away. That's absolutely true. But remember the key notion of irreducible complexity, and that is that this whole machine is completely useless until all the parts are in place. Well, that, that turns out not to be true. And I'll give you an example. What I have right here is a mousetrap from which I've removed two of the five parts. I still have the base plate, the spring, and the hammer. Now, you can't catch any mice with this, so it's not a very good mousetrap. But it turns out that despite the missing parts, it makes a perfectly good, if somewhat inelegant, tie clip. And when we look at the favorite examples for irreducible complexity, and the bacterial flagellum is a perfect example, we find the molecular equivalent of my tie clip, which is we see parts of the machine missing two, three, four, maybe even 20 parts, but still fulfilling a perfectly good purpose that could be favored by evolution, and that's why the irreducible complexity argument falls apart.